Oh, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's actually a pleasure to be here. I've, I've heard about this meeting for a long time, and I, I've wanted to attend, so now I, I finally get the opportunity. And Mike, I think half the room hasn't a clue who I am, but that's all right. Let, I'm actually an, an informatics academic geek, is what I am. But every now and then, I try to do something useful. Um, and, and I think what I'm going to describe to you today is some of the research work that we're engaged in in the SHARP initiative uh, that actually has a potential to be useful. So we'll, we'll look at that. Things I'm not going to talk about, uh, and I know you're going to be deeply disappointed, is ICD-11. I could go on for days about that. I know you're, you're fussing about ICD-10, but some of us are, are not. Uh, ISO and, and pharmacogenomics uh, things and, 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 and whatnot. So uh, I have a declarations page. I'm actually missing a key declaration, which is I have a very odd sense of humor. But uh, I have no, uh, no financial incentives here. This is all open source stuff I'm going to talk about. We try to make it up on volume, but it doesn't work. Um, <laughs> and of course, uh, like Clem, uh, the, uh, the comments represent the beliefs of the author, not Mayo Clinic or any of the other institutions with whom I am associated. Um, let's fuss about secondary use. You know, it's, a, it's, it's not a very practical term because I think, uh, as, as Devin was actually saying this morning, I agree with you, uh, secondary use, the way we've thought about it historically, is actually becoming of primary interest. Because what ultimately matters is how do we make patients better, right? And in a learning healthcare system, one of the ways you do that is by leveraging information so that you can figure out whether you're helping or hurting. That's the bottom line. And obviously, you want to shift through a data-driven process uh, to the side of trying to do more help than harm. But, but nevertheless, uh, here's a laundry list of fun things. Clinical quality improvement, comparative effectiveness. I mean, you can read the list. Those are all kinds of um, secondary use, although that bottom one is a bit interesting. Data-driven clinical decision support, what does that mean? Yeah, clinical decision support, the way it has historically been implemented and conceptualized, is you get these Delphi panels, or expert anecdote, as I like to call them, uh, where they'll make a you know, one-size-fits-all kind of clinical decision support rule. Then you're supposed to implement it. And then, of course, the alarm goes off and the clinician ignores it. Now, why does that happen? Because clearly, one-size-fits-all kinds of decision rules don't fit all. That's why it's one size doesn't really fit. Uh, and, and the whole premise of a data-driven decision support is that you're contextualizing the information and the workflow and the branching and the logic down to the granular level of detail that is pertinent to that specific patient for whom you are providing care. Now, ain't no decision support system on the planet does that, so this is fantasy land, but nevertheless, I think it's clearly where we want to go and is a kind of secondary use where we're leveraging contextual information about the patient to provide more uh, specific uh, uh, information and content. Well, this is, this is my trademark slide. I, I give this slide at every talk I ever give, whether it's relevant or not, but it's, it's sort of relevant today. Uh, and, and the whole premise here is that if we really want to think in a data-centric way, as I do, being a geek, uh, it all begins with a patient. And if we're clever, we can follow that information around the top of the circle. I mean, the names of the boxes don't really matter, but you get the idea. We somehow learn stuff, right? We generate new knowledge, no, uh, generate. And then we get tenure and we go home. But some of us stay around after school, and we, we finish the bottom side of the circle, which is somehow reinstilling this knowledge back into practice. So we make this samsara, this, this wheel of enlightenment, where, where we continuously learn uh, and you're not supposed to escape to nirvana. You're supposed to, you're supposed to provide better care in the context of it. But the question is, what holds that wheel together? What is the hub around which it, it, it spins? And of course, you can put anything you want in there. But being a good standards geek guy, I say, you know, it's handy. If you represent medical data and information about patients using the same terms, the same concepts, the same principles, the same structures that you do with respect to knowledge, and to use that knowledge, it's handy if that knowledge is in some way comparable and consistent with the clinical targets that you're actually trying to generate. So consistency matters. Compatibility matters. Standards matter. It's an efficiency thing. You don't have to use standards. You can throw people. It becomes a wicked problem. I learned this this morning uh, at, the, at the situation. And people can mediate between these things. But if you want any level of automation, if you want a prayer, of harnessing computers in a practical way, 
Comparability and consistency matters, standards matter, uh, and they should be done in a way that, that does not get in the way of the clinical care process. Now, I am a standards geek, I'm also an internist, so I, I understand that you don't want every field that every clinician has to feel, fill in for every patient in a structured field with a drop-down list. You know, it's the old, it takes an hour to fill in a five-minute visit. This is not a scalable solution. I get that. So uh, we'll, we'll try to look at what we're, we're babbling about. So one of, one of my um, mantras is that comparable and consistent data matters. It, it, whether you want to inference uh, information so that you can create the learning healthcare system, whether you want to categorize the information. Um, and at the end of the day, one of the core problems of comparable and consistent information is the dreaded vocabulary problem. Um, I've spent most of my career, in uh, my academic career, in, in the vocabulary space. And of course, people, when I started this, looked at me cross-eyed. They said, you know, Chris, why are you throwing your, your career away? You actually had the opportunity to be a useful person. Um, and, and because I believe at the heart of interoperability and consistency and comparability, unless we name things the same way, it doesn't mean we have to use the same terms. But we have to have a, a, a concept around which we anchor these things. I mean, this is the Loink stuff that Clem was doing most of his career uh, and the Rx norm things. We can have synonyms. We can have all kinds of things. Uh, I, I have no problem with that. But they have to map to a, 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 a consistent uh, target. Uh, and uh, usually, of course, this semantic consistency problem is manifest as the, uh, the value set problem. Well, here's a shock to you. Most clinical data in the United States is heterogeneous. I bet you didn't know that. Um, that clinical information systems sometimes will represent data differently from institution to institution, even with the same vendor. You know, you've seen one vendor implementation, you've seen one vendor implementation. That's the old joke. Uh, so it's within institutions correspondingly. You know, the, the cardiology system doesn't necessarily think the same way that the renal, uh, you know, uh, 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 support system might think so that the people down there on dialysis aren't ex in interoperating in a useful way with the, the tests that are coming out of the cardiovascular lab. Uh, and of course between institutions, it's, that goes without saying. Now I happen to be a meaningful use fan. I was on the HIT standards committee for uh, a while until they decided I wasn't useful anymore. Uh, but the, uh, the reality is meaningful use, and I think we all know this, doesn't go far enough that the specificity and granularity that you get out of a CCD, or I, I think uh, uh, Mike was saying this, and, uh, is good. I mean, it's clearly moved the nation forward in terms of comparability and consistency, but we're not there yet. Now, we could quibble about where there is, but to the degree to which we can have context-specific decision support, we're not there yet. The degree to which we can truly have uh, learning healthcare systems uh, based on value and, and best evidence practice. We're incrementally getting there, but we're not there yet. There's just not enough specificity. So uh, we, we need to go the next step, and I, I think we are. Uh, and what I'm going to talk to you about today is, is the set of sharp N grants uh, uh, from the uh, Office of the National Coordinator. Uh, it was a large grant program. There were four of them. Uh, they were kind of mega grants. The security one went to uh, Illinois. Uh, the uh, cognitive uh, science decision support one went to Texas. Uh, the uh, application layer of uh, you know the App Store model uh, went to Zach Kwane's group at Harvard, and we got the secondary use um, uh, award at Mayo Clinic and our partners. And that's what I'm going to focus on today because what I was asked to to tell you to share with you is what have we done for the past three and a half years with your taxpayer <laughs> dollars, and to what extent can it it pragmatically help you or help colleagues around you. Just to point out that it was a large consortium. Uh, we had lots of people, as you see, small businesses, some big businesses, lots of academic groups uh, collaborating on our particular uh, award in the Sharp N. And architecturally, we focused on normalization because we wanted this uh, comparability and consistency thing. I'm PI, I, I wrote the grant, and my vision was, gee, can we move the uh, ball down the football field here. Now, what we generated is not for small community hospitals. It's really for vendors. It's really for implementers. It's really for relatively sophisticated. We built a lot of middleware. 
We built a lot of stuff uh, that can be helpful. And the, what the stuff does is clinical data normalization, and that begs what are we normalizing to, and I'll, I'll, I'll address that. Natural language processing. Wasn't very long ago when we started dabbling in natural language processing, probably 10, 15 years ago, that it was considered sort of exotic, sort of expensive, not real reliable. I personally think of natural language processing as a commodity product these days, as something just like, you know, we all have Dragon on our cell phones. Uh, natural language processing in healthcare has become the same way. And there are many, many excellent open source natural language uh, processing products for healthcare. Uh, that can facilitate this data entry problem. Remember I was babbling that we don't want physicians to enter into structured fields for everything they say. You know, Chomsky told us that we have this little box in the back of our brain. We're language-centric animals. Uh, we communicate, we think, we even conceptualize in the context of language. And language is a hugely efficient information transfer mechanism. You've seen the experienced surgeons, of course, dictating into a phone or a uh, dictation device at three, four, sometimes 500 words a minute. I mean, these guys can go. Uh, hugely information efficient transfer. Low overhead for uh, the clinician. Now, the question is, what do we do with that? How do we turn it into manageable, comparable, consistent information? How do we leverage the content within text, within dictated information? And that's where the whole notion of natural language processing comes up. High throughput phenotyping, I'll talk about uh, and define, really. And then, of course, we used UEMA, the Unstructured Information Management Architecture from IBM. We've been the alpha user of that product since 2003. We did all of our, and that's the product, of course, that they used to build the Watson engine, the Jeopardy engine. Uh, it's all built on Unstructured, and they made the whole darn platform open source. Uh, we asked them to do that in 2003, and somewhat to my shock, they did. Uh, and then, of course, data quality and evaluation. So what we built in Sharp N, N for normalization, one of the four Sharp grants, is a library or suite of open source tools. They're all Apache 2 commercial friendly. For those of you that know your, uh, your open source licenses, Apache 2 is a particularly friendly license. It's non-viral. You can incorporate those elements into commercial products if you wish. Uh, we're per per perfectly happy to have people do that. And we position it explicitly as middleware. This is not an EMR system. This is not a user interface. This is not a console. There's, I mean, I could demo this stuff to you, and what you'd see is a blank screen with a computer working behind, you know, uh, not very exciting. Uh, it, we, the way I characterize it is we built the plumbing under the city. You know, you have these beautiful, gleaming cities with, with user interfaces and people that can interact and da da da. Patients can come and go. And we're into the plumbing. You know, how do you make the darn thing work? How do you actually? Uh, connect one building to another, one system to another, one environment to another, in a way that they can truly interoperate. And that's the middleware that we focused on. We made a tactical decision to initially focus on EMR messages, because writing interfaces to every electronic medical record system on the planet was perhaps not a useful activity, uh, particularly when most of them have these little data spigots that we call information exchange. Uh, using meaningfully being, you know, CDA or consolidated CDA or whatever the fashion is that week. And of course that HL7 thing, uh, CLEM, uh, version 2, uh, I might add. Uh, and we also focused a lot on clinical narratives and text because we believe there's a lot of gold in those hills uh, that it can be mined, salvaged, and, and used to improve healthcare discovery, all the secondary use applications uh, that I was describing. So what does it mean to normalize data? Well, simplistically, and you all know this, this is textbook kind of stuff. You got the syntactic normalization, right? You got to make sure the semicolons and the vertical bars and stuff are in the right place. And then you've got semantic normalization. Are you using the same value sets? Are you using the same names, the same terms, the same? And, and you can actually have semantics and structure. So are you, are you getting an information model that's coherent uh, with what you're trying to do? And typically, semantic normalization is some kind of vocabulary mapping. Uh, and syntactic transformation, of course, is uh, some kind of pipeline that normalizes the data. Now, we cheated. We leveraged the work that Clem and, and, and uh, Mark Overage, Mark is somewhere uh, here today, uh, did at uh, Reagan Street, uh, where they, they worked on a huge, uh, for 25, 30 years, uh, a body of work on data normalization. Uh, and we, uh, they, that was all also open source. So we, we heavily leveraged that, and indeed, in our Beacon project, I'm, I'm PI of a Beacon grant as well, uh, we, we actually use the Reagan Street data repository to, to manage this. Um, 
But, okay, we normalize. What do we normalize to? And it begs the question of what is your target? Uh, you have to have a canonical form if you're going to do the concept of normalization. I mean, you need a common denominator, kind of a lingua franca, whatever the heck you want to call it. Um, and there are, you know, lots of national and international standards. I actually chair the ISO committee for uh, health information and health informatics. I, I have a clue of what's going on internationally. Uh, and and the, the whole question of whether there exist national or international standards that can serve as a practical target is, is an intriguing one. And we could, we could debate that philosophically, but we concluded there weren't none that satisfied the level of granularity and specificity that we wanted, uh, particularly if we w focused on uh, messaging and canonical representation that was fully <laughs> machine manageable. So we adopted uh, the clinical data models or the clinical element models out of um, Utah. Uh, Stan Huff uh, is actually my co-principal investigator on this grant. Many of you know Stan. Stan and his work uh, at uh, uh, Intermountain Healthcare. Uh, outstanding body of work originating from the health system. And they've defined four or 5,000 clinical element models that they've published, made open source and interoperable. And, uh, that was our initial basis for retaining computable meaning and computable information. That was our common target. So we took everything that we got and we put it into clinical element models. Now this is an example of a clinical element model. Uh, this is the blood pressure uh, uh, measurement. You can see it's got a systolic and a diastolic and you could say, oh, good lord, why are they making it so hard? And it turns out that when you use information for secondary purposes, Context rules, the degree to which you want to use a blood pressure that was taken on a treadmill machine at the end of a treadmill testing is going to give you, how do I phrase this, some kind of distorted picture of what the patient's blood pressure actually might be. Uh, you know, are they hypertensive because, you know, they're up to 20 uh, mets and, and, and working their little heart out? Um, so you want to know the context. Or were they sitting quietly in an office uh, you know, the five averaged reads uh, with, with, the, with the physician or the nurse out of the room, you know, no white coat hypertension here, um, that sort of thing. I mean, those kinds of contexts matter. And this structure, which seems elaborate and tedious, gets at those kinds of issues. I mean, was it an ankle pulse? They actually measure those things for peripheral arterial disease. Uh, was it, a, was it a, a brachial pulse? Was it a, done with an ordinary cuff, a pediatric cuff? Was it a child? I mean, these things start to matter. So having well-structured information as a target, it doesn't mean you have to populate all that stuff. But if the information is there, it's handy to, to carry it along uh, and to know that you know, you're on a treadmill, if, if that's what was going on. Well, you could say that's a fairly arbitrary target. I mean, Stan's a nice guy. He's, he's smart. I actually like him. I respect him. Uh, uh, he's worked with Clem, of course, on, on this uh, clinical link stuff for a long time. Um, but who the heck is, you know, Stan Huff and, and Utah, and why should I care that they have this fun little pile of clinical element models that seem a little uh, parochial, uh, if nothing else? And, uh, of course, Stan knows that. Um, and he's created, for those of you that haven't heard of it, I'll give you a shameless plug for yet another open source specification effort, uh, the Clinical Information Modeling Initiative, which is when they're trying to take, and Stan has been remarkably successful, Basically, the interested parties around the planet that are interested in this archetype or template kind of thing, you know, how do you represent a blood pressure? How do you represent a, a, a medication order? How do you represent little Lego pieces of clinical information? Um, and of course, it includes the, the UK NHS folks, uh, the European SEN people, the HL7 template people, the ISO people, the CDISC, the research people in uh, clinical uh, research, and of course, the Intermountain SEM work, which I think is, is sort of a seminal. And they are harmonizing to a shared model that is internationally specified and used. And this is more than an academic pedantic project. I, mean, I am an academic pedantic guy, but as I said, occasionally I'm at risk of doing something useful. And uh, what the SIMI work is likely to do is to take the meaningful use data. I mean, Doug Fridsma at ONC is very interested in this. Uh, I was at the HL7 Advisory Council meeting yesterday where I sit and HL7 is thinking about creating the data layer for uh, records. I mean, HL7 is always focused on data interchange. And now the question is, can we define a core data layer 
for clinical, that comparable and consistent layer. Uh, so this is a movement towards that. This is what Sharp N embraced. We know that we embraced an interim structure. The clinical element models out of Utah will not last more than four or five more years. We know that. Um, but we think we can migrate these tools to the next uh, iteration, if you will, of specification. So we're not too worried about that. We nevertheless picked what we thought was a rational target so that we could do normalization in a meaningful way uh, and in a way that would generalize. Well, what about that semantic bit? Uh, that's all syntactic stuff for the most part, information models and structures. Uh, and the canonical semantics really come down to what value set are you going to bind to your clinical element model. Uh, and this is true in meaningful use as well. I mean, many of us hate the uh, specification of, of uh, uh, quality metrics that has come out of, of uh, the committee that I was on. Um, and uh, part of the reason we hated them is that in the first round or two, they didn't fully specify what the heck they meant. They didn't specify the value sets. Now, they're starting to do that. NLM has established the National Value Set Center. We're starting to get more consistency. And obviously, Sharp N, uh, if there's a meaningful use standard out there, we'll use it. I mean, we're not trying to invent anything new. We're quite the contrary. We're trying to consolidate issues so that we're getting a rational body of tools that actually builds on emerging national standards. So the value sets are drawn from the usual suspects, you know, SNOMED, ICD, LOINC, RxNorm. And uh, I could tell you my SNOMED ICD-11 story, but I won't. Suffice it to say, it's a happy marriage. Um, we, uh, another uh, tool that we're using in uh, uh, Sharp is uh, Common Terminology Services 2, something else that we've developed and promoted there so that you can manage vocabularies and value sets in a practical, scalable way. Again, uh, and the National uh, Value Set Center is, is actually going to adopt this as CTS2 uh, value uh, set services that we've written in Sharp, as will UMLS. And we create pipelines. Uh, the pipelines are in this unstructured information management architecture, that Jeopardy engine thing. So they're actually, actually blazingly fast and, and, and industry scalable. But we can intake heterogeneous data from any arbitrary source, really, as long as it's in a message format. HL7, consolidated CDA, uh, you know, CCD and its friends. And we can output um, rational structures, logical structures that conform to this clinical element model paradigm, to these little standard Lego pieces that we generate. Now, what do we do with those Lego pieces? We can serialize them because they're actually abstract structures. We can serialize them into a persistence layer. So what persistence layer do we actually use? Well, our initial persistence layer was an SQL database, but you know that there are lots of problems with SQL. We all know that, uh, and we knew that the persistence layer was arbitrary. Uh, so now we're actually using a non-SQL database. It, it's an, yet surprisingly an open source tool, uh, CouchDB, if you're familiar with it, or, or, or Big Couch uh, for the grid stuff. Uh, and it's late, the whole notion of late binding schema, so that you can take these Lego pieces and then assemble them when a query or a use case emerges or a data mart emerges into a schema that makes sense for that particular question. But you don't constrain your ability to ask questions on a predefined SQL schema or any relational schema. Um, so it's sort of an RDF-like model. We've also persisted into RDF. We've looked at PCAST. And of course, we persist into XML because that's sort of the, the least common denominator model. We started having prototypes of this tooling, this open source tooling available uh, just a little o o under a year ago. Uh, and this is sort of an architectural diagram of, of what it looks like. Uh, you can see we've heavily leveraged Mirth. I noticed a Mirth booth out there. Uh, the Mirth people were part of our consortium, uh, and they actually wrote a, um, a channel within Mirth to go into the UEMA, the unstructured, the, the IBM UEMA pipeline, uh, so that we can take you know information from usual uh, health information exchange models, uh, put them into a Mirth environment, send them through the normalization pipeline. That normalization pipeline, in turn, can branch on natural language processing issues, uh, data normalization issues. Uh, we can tell whether a laboratory value is a numerical value, a, an ordered field value, a, a sort of a value set of value, uh, and then create, render those into a, a normalized form as part of this clinical element model, and then persist it as either RDF or or uh, non-SQL or, or uh, whatever we want to persist it as, as you can see down on the lower point, and then operate across it. So that you, know, you can't really do analysis on data unless it's normalized. You know, you, if it's not comparable, 
then it's not comparable sort of by definition. Uh, and our whole goal, remember, is to generate comparable and consistent information so that we can understand what the heck is going on. In the NLP space, uh, we released CTAKES, which for those of you in academic worlds you might be familiar with. The CTAKES is a, a large um, uh, open source tool that is fairly widely used and, and variations on that, an open NLP workbench. And, um, uh, we also have some specialized uh, tools uh, to do medication uh, extraction, um, data normalization, uh, time uh, interval uh, tracking, and the like. Um, and what's interesting is that unlike a lot of other NLP tools out there, the output of our NLP stuff looks like the output that we'd get from an HL7 message or from a CDA message or from a consolidated CDA in that we use the same clinical element models as the target for our NLP extraction. So if you get the fact that the patient has a penicillin allergy, whether it comes from NLP, of course the provenance will be there. You'll know where it comes from. That's stored as explicit metadata. But whether you figured out that they have a penicillin allergy from the allergy list or from a clinical note or from a health information exchange message, doesn't matter. You still have that fact asserted in a clinical element model that is intercomparable regardless of the source. That's the whole philosophy behind what we're trying to do with data normalization. I'll move on to high throughput phenotyping. Uh, we overloaded the term because once you get all this data, what are you gonna do with it? We, uh, it came from the uh, eMERGE network, and I'll tell you a little bit about the eMERGE network. It's, it's basically uh, genotype to phenotype association data, uh, GWAS kinds of stuff. But uh, we found in the eMERGE network that we could create rules to identify cohorts of patients for study that would work in any arbitrary academic medical center, work reliably. That's what the whole eMERGE network was about. So that we could you know, get diagnosis procedures, demographic labs, and whatnot. And it was originally for research cohorts, but we, when we applied that in, in Sharpen, we said, you know, clinical trial eligibility can be the same kind of thing. Well, still kind of a geeky research thing. What about quality metrics? We all know that a quality metric is really a numerator and a denominator. And you have to define the cohort of patients that are going to be in your numerator and the cohort of patients that are going to be in your... So that's a kind of phenotyping, just like trying to define a research cohort. What about clinical decision support? You have to define the cohort of patients for whom the rule will fire. That's a cohort. And to us, that's a kind of phenotyping. So we see everything through phenotyping glasses. Uh, this is the classic uh, database or uh, slide out of um, uh, National Human Genome Research Institute that shows the costs of, of uh, genotyping. Uh, it was initially falling down on Moore's law. This is a logarithmic scale. Uh, and then it fell off Moore's uh, law and, and just went through the, through the floor. It basically became cheap as, as, as any. Anyway. So it's not just cost, but it's also time. So I can genotype, or for that matter, I can almost sequence this room, uh, probably not for a whole lot more money than has been spent on this conference, and I could probably do it in an afternoon. I'd have a much harder time getting the clinical characteristics of this room from electronic medical records because the rate limiting effect was how do we get clinical phenotype from uh, the records. And that's what the EMR phenotype algorithms came from that I described. They came from the eMERGE network, uh, and they were generated in a way that Physicians could write the rules, or, or other healthcare experts could write the rules. Patients could go in. You'd have a pipeline that would identify the cohort. Uh, we've written those pipelines. Obviously, there's a lot of UEMA stuff, but the rule logic itself is in drools. And uh, we, we've published this recently. This is our third meeting. Uh, you can see the crowd's getting a little larger if you've been following these pictures um, uh, of, our, of our annual meeting of the Sharp N team. Um, and I just want to say that we use our beacon as a natural laboratory to evaluate whether these tools are working in the real world or not. So there's a lot of synergy between my beacon and, and my SHARP grant, so to speak, uh, as we move forward. So in conclusion, comparable and consistent data matters. The importance of some kind of canonical form, we've picked a relatively arbitrary one, but we think a rational one that is, is going to sustain and, and be usable into the future. Uh, as the target of that transformation. Standards are rapidly evolving and coalescing, I add. Meaningful use is a good start, but not good enough. Uh, and they know that. It, it's not as though they're not thinking about it. And that our sharp end tooling facilitates normalization, natural language processing, and phenotyping as a body of middleware 
that can help people get their jobs done. Thanks. And that way we can record it as part of the, uh, the video. So. Hello. Hi, I'm Devira Gabriel. I'm from UC Davis. Hello, gentlemen. It's nice to see you all. Um, I know the uh, name of your presentation or the, the panel was um, Major Investments, and I wondered if maybe you could briefly speak to something I'm running into with my clients, which is there are groups out there, and in particular for me, um, my clients are a lot of research groups that understand and want to have interoperable data. But there's a real big disconnect between what it costs in terms of sweat equity and mind share and investment with people to get these folks to, to, then, uh, to, to go ahead and get these projects done. So all of us in this room, I think, really understand you know, the, the, the need. And I think that um, uh, your projects have had um, financial support. But could you give me some advice or give us advice when you run into situations where folks think they, they want to comply with MU or they, or they want interoperable data, but they're just not seeing that it's really kind of expensive because it's people's time and, 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 and their mind share, et cetera? Thanks. Thank you, Devera. Good to see you. Um, I'll take two approaches to that. One, I think the provider marketplace needs to be much more proactive with respect to their demands from vendors than historically they have been. Now, I understand vendors are under the gun. They're being crushed by meaningful use. Just ask them. They'll tell you um, if they haven't already. Uh, but that being said, I think the vast majority of providers, including relatively sophisticated providers like, you know, Mayo and Kaiser, are not yet demanding the kind of interoperability out of the box that one would hope for. Now, you know, things like the HL7 common data layer may facilitate that. Uh, meaningful use may get down to the level of granularity with SIMI projects or something that will facilitate that. But we're not, we're not there yet, partially because, you know, the providers are to blame. We as customers have not insisted on it. The other dimension of this is that I'm staggered by the level of not invented here philosophy that permeates through the informatics community. It seems, you know, I, I actually trained as an epidemiologist, too. And, and of course, what you're supposed to do as an epidemiologist is make up your own damn questionnaire. You're, you're considered a bad epidemiologist if you use somebody else's questionnaire. And the informatics academics are, are, are equally guilty. You know, I'll, I'll fall over dead if I use some of Mike's stuff or Clem's stuff. I mean, why would I do that? Uh, but we really, as a community, have to recognize, and I think Mike said it very well in his talk, we want to borrow heavily what works and what helps. And we seem to have had this more resistance in that space than uh, seems warranted. <clears throat> I don't know if anybody else wants to add to that. Very well. Yeah. I don't have any magic. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's, that's like the, uh, the question of the ages. Uh, so I don't, I don't think there's any answer easy for it except just keep pounding on it. Um, I wanted to make one observation, and that is um, we've been wrestling with this for a couple of decades. Um, one of the questions um, in the postmortem on the CHIN projects was how can we automate without increasing the cost of health care? What, where, where, where does it become unbalanced and we're just adding cost? Great information, better care, but adding cost. So it's always a, a problem. What? Um, this is for Chris. I have to say, after I'm going to ask, uh, does that cloud look like a horsey? And she just asked the meaning of life. So I, I have to, <laughs> uh, uh, I, ha I have to apologize in advance. But but uh, I'm going to say thing some things later that that don't specifically call out Simi, but they're quite relevant uh, in terms of a philosophy of. We're combining experience here. We're not making it up from whole cloth. We have a lot of models. We, we, we want to find a way to represent them, and then we want to do some uh, 
And then we want to see how it's doing, and then we want to do some more, or maybe looking at leveraging a large supply of models that are already in, in an old format. Uh, when that approach, which is incremental, comes into the environment of, of government interest and, 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 uh, and existing organizations, there tends to be some of this not invented here stuff that you're talking about. HL7 has been attempting to address the same questions through several different efforts, and if I try to call them out specifically, I'll name them, but they've attempted to get the specific what I call molecules of, uh, of information. Um, and uh, Simi seems to have gotten hung up on the methodological issues of how to represent, largely through the involvement of the U.S. government. Uh, do you think Simi is going to survive all that and, and actually create a, a, uh, uh, a standing contribution that would simplify HL7, that, that would uh, uh, be easily mechanically transported into IT systems, all of the p potential benefits that SIMI has? That's an easy question, Wes. Uh, no problem. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I will preface this by saying, of course, these are my personal opinions. I don't think SIMI and SIMI, for those of you who have forgotten, is the Clinical Information Modeling Initiative. This is what Stan Huff and the International Collaboration are working to create these Lego pieces uh, as, a, as a shared resource. I don't think SIMI in its current form will survive unscathed. I think it will morph into something different. But I think the principle of having international collaboration to define these core elements these reusable Lego pieces. And as I said, this there are four or 5,000 CEM models that we've stripped down to about 15 or 20 basic types in Sharp N uh, because we, we've put a lot of the detail into the vocabulary and vocabulary binding. Is, and that's sort of the way you can simplify a model as you put all the details in a vocabulary. Um, I think it's inevitable that something like this will continue, whether it becomes a de facto extension of CDA because they'll meet. I mean, a mashup of CHIMI and CDA is sort of where, in an obvious world, we should go. Um, but the world isn't always obvious. The problem, as you know, Wes, and you know perhaps better than anybody, is the representation paradigms. CIMI has adopted uh, open air archetype, AML archetype modeling language, which is superbly well suited for its use case. Not as familiar to a lot of people. There are a lot of people in the U.S. that are insisting that it be done in UML, uh, Unified Modeling Language. Well, they're interconvertible, but they're not the same. Uh, and then there are people that say, well, what about the RIM? It should be a pure RIM derivative with all the you know, constraint logic associated with, with the RIM. And I, I was a big RIM basher in my youth, but I've, 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 in my dotage, I'm starting to understand the elegance of a, of a um, constraint model. Uh, particularly if you want interoperability. And UML is the opposite. It's not a constraint model. It's an expansion model. So you get deep philosophical issues around how the heck you do this. And that's what people are hung up on right now uh, in that community. And that's what is likely to rip that community apart, if anything. Not, not the goal, or the, but the, you know, the detailed methods and, and the infrastructure. We, we can chat at lunch here. <laughs> Now, I, I want to comment on that, not, and not because I know much about SIMI, and I should know more about SIMI, but I think that it has, I mean, just, just from your presentation, it has the advantage versus um, using CDA as, as an empty cloth or as, you know, a green field and just writing specific, have to read them very carefully, figure what it's like for each clinical thing, which is kind of happening. Uh, I think it would be a massive improvement because you would have expectations about the pieces and the parts and you could look at it more tabularly rather than trying to read 42 pages of narrative, you know. Laura? So I was going to direct this to, to you, Christopher, but I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to generalize the question. We know that one of the looming problems we're having with interoperability is how much data is available 
in, you know, regardless of the form and all that other stuff. And I'm, I'm wondering if there's yet starting to be a conversation about waiting for relevance, number of times, you know, sources. Because I think as we do clinical decision support and we actually look at having a more data-driven system, I mean, you know, the simplest example is tag clouds, right? The number of instances, the larger. So I'm just interested in is that conversation starting to arise yet, or do we need to somehow infuse that conversation? Because that's the, the problem that we hear from physicians is, I'm overwhelmed with information, and how do I know whether it's the right information under the right circumstances and things like that. So I know some of this is addressed in the phenotyping and all of those things, but I'm particularly curious about if the conversation of waiting and source and all of those kinds of things is starting to emerge. I'm happy to go, but let other people talk. <clears throat> well, I actually, I, I, I'm not positive what, you, what your question was, so I maybe you shouldn't be able to start, but let me, I, I don't, there are two kinds of issues that I know about. One of them is there's data that in general physicians all want. And I want to emphasize in general, they want, in fact, someone once said if you give them lab tests and farm, they're happy, that's all they need. And I think it does go a long way. And I don't know whether there's a question of what, what they want in that space. But there's another issue, is they don't want random data that they have to be responsible for reacting to uh, for legal reasons. So that's a different aspect of it. And how you sort that out, I don't know. So what I'm specifically, that's in the general area. But what I'm specifically talking about is, so claims data would be a good example, right? The claims data or clinical data made in an encounter would potentially, or maybe should, have a different relevance towards an overall consolidated patient record? That's what I'm talking about. Like, is well, there that I've got a bias, but I would say clinicians, they got their own claims. They know what they claim. I don't think they're interested in it. Researchers could be, because it's the, if it's the only source. Well, uh, I, I have a slightly different take, and I, I, I love Mark Fizzi's uh, coal-fired jet engine metaphor this morning. That was extraordinary. Um, yeah, with respect to you know whether claims data is in fact a medical record, uh, but I, I would answer your question differently. I see the issue of of you know is the data there and is it the right data coming down on two sides of the problem. One is the problem of data fragmentation. So for any given patient's record, uh, Clem you know cited that there are what 4.3 providers in the average patient's uh, life in, in any given year. Uh, and we've done in, in the pharmacogenomics research network and in the uh, eMERGE network uh, research that shows that if you focus on a cohort within a single provider hospital, you get misclassification errors, whereas if you look at it from, say, a beacon community-wide error, uh, assuming we can get authentication and authorization, uh, that uh, you know, your, your, reclassi your, your classification errors diminish rapidly so that we know that data is fragmented across different providers. Obviously, we're studying this from a research perspective, but guess what? It matters from a clinical perspective, too. Uh, we'll get into data segmentation sorts of debates later this afternoon. Uh, so the fragmentation is a big problem. The second big problem is um, you know, whether the information is recorded at all anywhere. Uh, and we all know that there's hugely relevant things that never get put into the record. Uh, patient reported outcomes, uh, you know, uh, ancillary things. And part of the problem is time pressure. You know, we can't uh, allow, uh, physicians have limited time and, and limited user interface. And then there's the information entry problem. So we, we can't get everything into the record that we ultimately want that should be there that is actually relevant to making decisions and understanding what's going on with a particular patient. And this begs alternate ways of, for the data fragmentation problem, creating community-based records, population-based records. And for the data entry problem, really being open to, uh, you know, the physician doesn't have to put every, or the, for that matter, the nurse or the professional hair, caregiver doesn't have to put every iota of information into the record, that there can be a lot of patient information that's shared in the same space. Just to um, go off on, on the information creation piece, I, I just think we haven't focused 
a lot of effort on that in the last 10 years, really. Been focused on the use of data afterwards. And as I said in my talk, it really all starts with that. And, uh, and as Chris is pointing out, we really need to think differently about how we do that. Right now, it's, we've taken the traditional medical record and we've put it into an electronic form. And we're forcing physicians to do things that they've done before, but do it in a much harder way with much more difficult tool than just dictating it. And, uh, and I can tell you, if I had to take a word count, maybe this is a study maybe Fun might want to do, is what are the most relevant pieces of information in a note? And I think you'll find it's probably 10% of the note or 20% of the note is key. The rest is fluff and, you know, uh, appendages that really don't need to be documented by the physician. Um, when uh, the uh, CAP did a, a, a study with, uh, in Ontario, Cancer Care Ontario, they did this just around pathology reports. Um, and they, they focused in on synoptic reporting, which is the sort of reduced pieces of data about, about the case. Pathologists were absolutely uh, against that. Uh, they were obviously forced to do it in, the, in Ontario for the project. And after all of that, they became actually quite positive about it, and it reduced their time in terms of documentation. So if you have them put in key pieces of information, and it's an easy maneuver to do, you don't need all that other fluff. In my institution, you just have to see the note load. And the, when Clem is talking about having to read physician's notes, it's, it's a thing that just, it's, it just expands the mushrooms incredibly when everybody's doing a poor job of documenting that way. And then I have to read the crap. Okay, and go through it and spend 15 minutes to figure out what was important. There have been discussions about APSO notes, you know, assessment plan first, and I think we need a fundamental rethinking. It's sort of like Larry Weed, you know, part two, but I'm not necessarily saying we have to do what Larry said to do. I think his philosophy was right, and we haven't focused on the data creation part at all, and it's really such an important part. Because if you end up with garbage, you'll end up doing nothing but moving garbage, and you can't do anything with that. Hi, my name is Bill Nadell. I'm with Flexa Health. And I think this is a very quick question in terms of the clinical element harmonization. Uh, I know you're moving to RDF, and that's like a W3C standard. So immediately, it's not just in the medical community. You have a whole Web 2.0 group or Web 3.0 group of people available to work with it. Are you working with ontologies? and specifically OWL, which is a W3 specification, and the benefit being you have an ontology, maybe a base or an upper ontology, or you can then put it into reasoning and inferencing engines uh, to do automated uh, decision support with the data. Yeah, I, I actually am one of the co-PIs of the National Center for Biomedical Ontology with uh, Mark Musen out at Stanford. I, ontologies are really the core of my research, I, I, uh, and I, I've become a postmodern ontology kind of guy, in that I've more or less rejected ontologies as something that are practical in healthcare. And the reason is they're, as you know, a derivative of first order predicate logic, uh, some sort of computably consistent uh, derivative. And um, uh, the owl flavor of, of a description logic is, is a practical compromise in expressiveness and computability. But, the, but they're all based on, on pure logic on pure is a relationships for at least the uh, reasoners and consistency computation. And it turns out healthcare ain't real good on always true logical conditions. You know, what's an MI? Well, you know, crushing substural pain, radiating into the eye, da, 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 troponin, EKGs. Well, not always. You have a silent MI, so is that an MI? Uh, you get into these really peculiar uh, exceptions that medicine is probabilistic. And pure description logics, which again, are being a subset of first order predicate logic, can't handle the concepts of probability at all. And therefore, in my opinion, are a rather poor uh, basis for um, medical reasoning. Um, in your work with Stanford, are you looking at some of the hidden Markov model work that's going on to uh, do sort of uh, unsupervised machine learning? Yep. I'd like to talk about that if possible. Thank you. Also. Two quick last thoughts following up first on this woman's wonderful first question. I think in addition to providers putting pressure on vendors that we should also ask ONC and the government. Uh, 
to be insisting that interoperability be easier and connectivity, especially to HIE from EHR vendors. So if everybody in this room can help make that happen, I think that'd be fabulous. That's the right kind of pressure. Um, and my second thought about the, uh, the analytics comment is that there are systems, analytic systems today, that exist that siphon off two one thousandths of the diagnostic data from physicians before it enters the EHR systems. And in an in analytic system can present a patient's uh, or, or a physician's patient panel or the chronic disease panels of a clinic weekly, monthly, quarterly. So you see trend data and graphically you can see it of where your patients are going. And it's only that two one thousandths of the data, which if you can give the frontline physician before they get overwhelmed with all of that data, that's what we need writing on every HIE, I think. Thank you. I think I, before I came, I actually read over HIPAA looking for what it talked about in health information exchanges. And, and it certainly was, it had a positive tone, but it didn't really specify anything that had to be done for them. And it, there are some things that will certainly be enabling. So I'd really support that, um, not as a government person. I mean, I think that we, we, we should try to stimulate that. But it comes back to messaging and codes, though, because to, you know the exchange, if it doesn't get stuff it can understand, it's not going to help. So I think you've got to deal with both. That basic raw data that every clinical record needs, it's in machines already, so no one has to type in anything, and getting them to make it deal with the issues to get it to HIEs uh, would, I think, be very good. Um, Clem, I wanted to add one thing to that. I, what always confused me uh, a decade ago when I started working in health information exchange was the extent to which people thought that they couldn't do health information exchange because they didn't have an EHR. And I, I was puzzled because there was so much data that was already electronic. Sure, they weren't using an EHR, but we had plenty of raw data to start. So. Well, well, to spin on that, I think, it, you know, if you had a real community exchange with everything in it, why do you need an EHR in your office? You know, okay. I, mean, I mean, it should be the cheapest way to do it. It's one interface. I mean, it's, I know all the political social things that so far have presented that, but it's still, ultimately, it's got to be so cost effective. That you are right. One cloud. Mm -hmm. Last question, and then we'll, we'll break for lunch. Sure. Uh, I had a question on the middleware uh, conversation you had. And uh, do you see a role for a middleware in a community setting where uh, physicians, smaller practices are connecting to a community health information exchange, do you see that as a solution to solve the in expensive interface costs and the time constraints? Uh, yeah. Uh, not for the small physician offices, maybe for the vendors that are associated with them. I, and I mean, the kind of middleware that Sharp N is producing is what HIEs really want to use. and and other, you know, maybe ACOs would want to use, not necessarily the single physician. And I also recognize that if, you know, my plan for world domination succeeds and we do have a single data layer specified by HL7 or somebody, then the need for this normalization middleware goes out the window, which is actually perfect because we'd all be generating data in a, you know, comparable and consistent form to begin with. So I see middleware as an interim solution and mostly effective at the data aggregation consolidation layer, not necessarily the single position layer. No, no but I guess uh, somebody's have, you know, some vendor setting up a middleware to connect all this uh, physician level. Would that be a model to offset the cost that each uh, physician has to incur to connect with the health information exchange if, if it's done at a, at a scale level? At well, a higher scale? yes, to the extent that the vendor that they rely upon for their you know, uh, EMR environment, does that work for them? I, I can't imagine a small physician office getting their hands dirty. I mean, you don't ask, you know, the chauffeur to repair the car. Um, that's, that's just r rarely done in, in the 21st century. You go to a car repair place. Um, I don't have a chauffeur, but if I did, that's, that's what they do. Um, <laughs> And uh, analogously, I, I can't imagine, you know, somebody who's trying to provide care and their, their immediate associated office getting involved in the technical details and layers, you know, a middleware layer of, of uh, trying to facilitate 
uh, the operation continuing to move. So it's, it's a division of labor more than anything else. Got it. Thank you. All right. Um, I want to thank, I want everybody to applaud this uh, magnificent panel. <laughs>